When I was a young Christian attending a good evangelical youth group, we were expected to read our Bibles every day and we were encouraged to read it as if it was a personal word from God to us. I don't know if that was the experience of everybody here who attended the Christian youth group, but the idea was that you shouldn't get too bogged down in trying to analyse the text too deeply, to accept it as a personal message from the Creator, spoken directly to you as an individual. And sometimes that is a very natural way to read the Bible. Come to me, all ye who labour and are heavy laden. Hey, that's me! Some passages do feel like a direct personal word from the Almighty, but others do not. And today's reading from Acts chapter 11 is surely one of those not passages. I'll read to you the portion again. So Peter went up to Jerusalem. The circumcised believers criticized him and said, He went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheep being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord, nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Now I'm going to cut off the reading uh, at, at that point, because the biggest full story is a long story. And the story told in chapter 11 is actually a retelling of the story of chapter 10, you can tell that at the heart of both stories is this dream. And in terms of the Bible being a personal message to me, uh, it has to be said that this dream is not something I can remotely identify with. I mean, Peter dreams of all sorts of animals sort of being lowered down on some sort of giant picnic rug. And he's told, kill and eat. I mean, look, I like food. I personally can't imagine having to kill anything I, I wanted to eat. But moreover, I don't have a problem with pork. And that's, that's the real issue here. Kill and eat, the voice says to Peter, to which Peter replies, Surely not, Lord, nothing unclean has ever entered my mouth. In other words, Lord, I don't eat pork. Or crustaceans, or birds of prey, or other animals with uncloven hoof, etc., etc. I mean, if, if this is supposed to be God's personal word for me today, I've got to say, Lord, this is not my issue. I already eat pork. I've already eaten it, most of the other people I know have no reservations about it either. I'm not uh, suggesting that this passage isn't one. I find interesting, and I'm not saying there isn't material here that I find confronting. But what has the lifting of the prohibition regarding pork really got to do with me? Of course, I mean, I appreciate there are people, that people in this church community who may well refrain from eating pork or meat in general, but I don't think that's for especially religious reasons. Um, I know, for instance, that Ange is concerned about inhumane treatment. The farm and animals that are used for uh, human consumption. I know she gets a lot of arguments on Facebook over this. She tells me there's a fair degree of hostility on Facebook between some of her vegan friends and um, some of the evangelical Christians that she's uh, befriended. Uh, indeed, she showed me um, a picture recently on there of a dog and a pig side by side. The one of the vegan people had posted in the caption underneath him, uh, what's the difference, I think it was. In, in other words, why do you kill and eat one and, and, you, and not the other? And Anne says she didn't appreciate it when one certain well-known evangelical clergyman uh, said, uh, but the dogs are full of tasty bacon. Or something like that, she felt trivialised the issue, which it does, of course. I mean, I appreciate there aren't genuine 
issues involved with animal cruelty. But I also recognize this is an entirely different issue from the one that bothered Peter and the other apostles. Now, Peter wasn't concerned about killing pigs because it was cruel. He didn't want to touch them because they were unclean and hence forbidden, ritually unclean, religiously unclean creatures. I mean, of course, the real issue here in Acts isn't really so much about food as it is about people. And the breaking down of the food barriers is just the, the leading edge of a more comprehensive breaking down of barriers between people of different racial and religious backgrounds who eat these different foods. Uh, but even then, accepting Gentiles into our midst, that's not my issue either. I mean, who are these Gentiles in Acts 11 that the apostles are all concerned about? The people at the twelve feared were going to pollute their religious community. They're us. I mean, this is one of the jarring things that I got stuck on again when I read through this story again this year. I always think of the apostles, you know, particularly Peter, James and John perhaps, as being my kind of guys. I always imagine if I could sort of transport myself back into the first century, that really got on well with those boys. I mean, reading through this passage again made me realise that if I were coming towards Jesus' disciples on the road, they'd most likely cross to the other side to avoid being contaminated by me. I mean, that's hard to accept when you're an upright middle class white boy like me. I mean, we upright middle class white boys, we're not used to, we're used to being the ones that show the prejudice, not the ones on the receiving end. Of course, we good church people don't do that, do we? Certainly not us progressive Australian church going people. We never show prejudice towards people because of their skin colour or country of origin. Unless they're refugees, of course. Not white Arabs, not Muslim Arabs, at any rate, or perhaps Chechens. I don't know if you've been following the propaganda lately, but I get a feeling that Chechens are a new group of people we're supposed to hate. You know, the Boston Mormons were Chechens, and we've been told. All of a sudden, I'm hearing about Chechens in Syria, and there's Chechens everywhere. I get the feeling that the way is being paved for some violent targeting of a lot of Chechen people. Or maybe we're just supposed to hate them because they're Muslims. I mean, I'm not sure, you know. It's hard sometimes to keep up with where you're supposed to be focusing your prejudices, isn't it? I mean, well, I know we Australian people like to think we're a little better than others, that we really are and now a model of tolerance and harmonious multiculturalism. In many ways, we have one of the worst records in the world. I mean, let, let's do a little quiz here. I, I checked the facts on this. When was the slavery of African people banned in Britain? Anyone? 1842. 1807. If the slave trading was actually made legal, and the Slavery Abolition Act was passed in 1833. An easier one is when was slavery abolished in the United States? Easy for me, isn't it? If you've seen the movie Lincoln. 86. 1865 was the answer. It's February 1865, it passed the 13th Amendment. When did Australia finally recognise our indigenous people as being human beings? May 27, 1967, before the Australian Aboriginal people were actually dealt, they were treated, recognised under the law as being human. Before that, they were dealt with under the Four and Fauna Act. I mean, 1967 was not that long ago. I mean, I was five years old. I don't remember, you know, that day, but I bet you some of my indigenous playmates in kindergarten then, they probably still do remember. I remember the Irish comedian Dave Allen was sort of saying that his experience of Australian people, he said um, some of the most gracious, open hearted, generous people he'd ever met in, in, in the entire whole world. He said there was only the white bastards he couldn't get on with. We don't have a great record 
and you know that's part of, of this here. And this passage is confronting because it's it's all about shifting prejudices. But in truth, what I find most confronting personally about this story is not the shift that the disciples had to make in their thinking, but the way they got there. I mean, what I find a little unnerving in this story is the fact that these people, these good, godly people, changed their minds about what God required of them with regards to what they should eat and who they should mix with on the basis of, of what? On the basis of a piece of scripture that they had never read before? On the basis of an ex cathedra statement from the Pope or whatever his first century equivalent was? On the basis of a direct word from Jesus himself? They shifted their entire understanding of their faith based on a dream that Peter had and on their intuitions about what the Holy Spirit was telling them. I mean, that's really quite bizarre when you think about it. These people overturning stuff that was, that was written. Written in the Scriptures. Written there completely unambiguously. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 11. It's written, don't eat pork. I quote, the pig, though it has divided wolf, does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. You must not eat their meat or touch their carcasses. They are uh, unclean for you. Leviticus 11, 7 to 8. There it is. In black and white. You can't argue with that. Can you? I mean, on the one hand, there you have the Word of God in all its unambiguity. On the other hand, you have Peter's latest dream. I mean, which one would you consider authoritative? The disciples go to the dream. That doesn't sit comfortably with me. As a good evangelical with a high regard for the scriptures, I know how you argue for something new and innovative. You do what you do, what Keith's doing in his latest article about gay marriage. You can be found on arrestlessfate.com.au if you haven't read it. You, you do a deep exegetical analysis of the wording of, of the text. You compare that particular biblical law with other biblical laws. You look at the way in which the biblical writers themselves have adapted laws that are similar to that one. Peter and the other apostles do absolutely none of these things. They accept Peter's dream and apparently disregard everything else. I and mean, that's painful. It's actually, because it's actually that method of biblical scholarship that allows us good evangelical Christians to draw our line around who are the legitimate interpreters of God's word and who are not. That's how we judge the insiders and the outsiders. That's how we know who can be taken seriously as a spiritual teacher. We look for that sort of scholarship and we listen to those who practice it and we engage in intelligent conversation according to the rules of that game. And those who do not play that game, such as those who wake up and tell us all the things that God taught them in their sleep, we write off. But you can't write off the apostles. And you can't write off this dream. You know this dream did come from God. And I don't know why God couldn't have revealed this to the apostles in a Bible study. But he did what do we do with that? Where do we go from there? What, what principles of biblical interpretation can we draw from that? What template of divine communication can we put in place on the basis of this, of this account? How can we use this experience to be able to better predict the will and the activities of God in the future? And as far as I can see, there are absolutely no satisfactory answers to any of those questions. I, I do think that what we evangelicals need to recognize is that God is God. And that God will do whatever God chooses to do, and God will communicate with us in whatever way God deems to be appropriate at the time. And in the end, there's absolutely no way of 
predicting exactly what God's going to do next. And, and that's all a little difficult to take on board. But I'm having enough trouble trying to find room in my heart for homeless people and refugees without having to make room on the top for a God whose movements I cannot anticipate and whose mind is being I will never truly understand. So maybe there is a personal message in this for me after all. Maybe the personal message for me today is expect the unexpected. Let God be God. Dream God's dreams. May God have his blessing and his own personal message to you.